The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, just a quick sound check, Eric. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me all right? Yep, you sound real good. We're Great. just seeing a few stragglers come in. I'm just going to hold off another 30 seconds. And if you're attending our webinar, you should see the screen uh, with Eric's smiling face and with a little bit of information about him. And you won't know if you can't hear me, but um, we just did a sound check so that we can hear each other. And uh, we're about to begin our presentation for you. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar today on 3D embroidery. My name is Alice Wolf. I'm the manager of education and publications for Madeira USA. Uh, we are very, very pleased and excited to have Eric Campbell with us today. A lot of you already, I'm sure, already know Eric based on all of the writing and the blogging and that he does, his use of social media seminars that he does at several different trade shows, uh, webinars that he's done, some of them with us in the past and the uh, previous ones that he's worked on with us are on our website. Um, we are uh, working on this, sorry, um, Eric has worked with us on other webinars and he brings a high level of expertise uh, delivered with enough of a sense of humor to leave embroiderers richer for the experience and either confident that they are up for trying something new or able to apply his suggestions in order to perfect their craft. I uh, just want to let everybody know, please type in your questions as we go along. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions in real time as possible. Eric has very graciously agreed to answer any remaining questions that uh, don't get answered today in this hour. And we will be sending out an email with those answers and questions to everyone after. Uh, we are uh, recording the webinar and it will be available to you all to watch um, at your discretion after uh, we're finished recording it. We will have a printable version of the PowerPoint slides. And at the end of the webinar, we'll be offering you a special from Madeira <clears throat> USA and from Eric to thank you for the time that you've spent with us today. Uh, there are handouts available as well, along with some product handouts. Eric has very graciously uh, created a kind of a four-page um, handout that is meant to be a companion piece to the PowerPoint slides that uh, we've worked on and that you can download as well. So at this point, Eric, I'd like to welcome you from all of us at Madeira USA, and I'd like to turn the webinar over to you now. Thank you very much for having me here, and uh, always happy to work with Madeira, especially because you guys are so committed to uh, educating the embroidery industry. All right, so uh, hopefully you guys are all uh, well acquainted with me now, and uh, Alice has given me a great introduction. Hopefully I can live up to that for you folks. But for today, what we're really going to be talking about is 3D foam embroidery, very specifically 3D foam. I know 3D embroidery, some people may mean other things by that. You may have uh, pieced together or free floating embroidery, but this is about 3D foam. So if you have questions or trouble with 3D foam, this is what we're going to address. This is really about the theory behind how to digitize and execute for 3D foam. And I'll be giving you uh, my take on how that's done. But first, let's start with these keys to success for 3D embroidery. The first thing is you should accept that there are many ways to accomplish 3D foam embroidery. Why do I say this? Well, here's an old saw that you'll, you've heard me say if you've ever asked me personally a question on the trade show floor about 3D foam. Uh, if you ask three digitizers how to do it, you'll get five answers and they're all right. And what that really means is that there are multiple ways to accomplish 3D foam embroidery. There's things that I'm going to say today that you may not agree with or that you've had a file that runs okay that uh, does, does differently than what I do. But that's okay. There are many ways to make this happen. This isn't the only way, but I'm going to give you the way that I tend to do 3D foam. And I'll explain why I do it the way I do it as we go so that you have an idea, at least the theory behind my technique. 
So accept that there are many ways to do this and uh, try and learn a little bit from the one I give you and hopefully it'll help your technique develop. Uh, success in 3D Foam is based on many different parts. And what I mean by that is it's not just the digitizing. I'm going to talk pretty heavily about the digitizing today because it's the thing that I did the most and the thing that I am most interested in where my expertise lies. However, success is not just based on digitizing. Though it is a big influence in it, it also has to do with materials and the execution and the finishing. And you can't really take any of those things out of the equation. So really, this is about a holistic approach. What do I mean by holistic? It means you have to take the whole thing into account when you're looking at it. Uh, it cannot just be about one element. I know I've said this before. I'm going to say it three or four times the same way. It's because anything can throw the embroidery off. Even if your digitizing technique is great, if you use foam that doesn't tear away cleanly or maybe it doesn't hold up in the way that you like it, maybe you use the wrong kind of foam for the look that you're trying to get and you'll have a result that you're not as happy with. So you have to use the correct foam. Uh, if you use a technique or maybe you don't do the finishing in the way that you should or don't do any finishing at all after you've stitched out and maybe you won't have as clean a result as you're expecting. So all of these parts have to be taken into account and none of them can be left out if you want a clean retail styled look in your 3D foam. And so once again, good digitizing. Why do I stress this? Is because honestly, 3D foam must be catered to. Some people will go ahead and just say, well, the primary difference is density. And it is. The primary difference between 3D foam uh, designs and designs for flat embroidery is density. That's the first thing you're going to look at. And especially we're talking about satin stitches. We'll talk about stitch types later. But density is the first thing you change. However, there are things to be done with angles, with underlay, and with stitch types that are important and critical to 3D foam. So you need to digitize specifically for the medium. You can't just take a design and convert it into a 3D foam design without considering all of these elements or you won't get the result that you want. Eric, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second or two. Uh, sure. A question came in um, asking if uh, people that are attending the webinar should be sitting near their machines. I'm going to take the liberty of answering that question and point out, um, as we did in our invitation, that this isn't a beginner course in how to embroider but rather uh, wanting to keep everybody up on this very trending um, method of embroidery. And so, no, you don't need to be near your machine because Eric is talking about how to go about it, and it's not a um, first do this and then do that type of thing. So just oh, certainly. And enjoy. I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, clarify for the digitizing side of this. Uh, this is going to be um, software agnostic. Any software you have can be used for this. Uh, I can certainly later talk about what software I use if you want to contact me privately. But I'm not here to advertise software or advertise anything in particular. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the theory behind it. There will be some numbers, like we'll talk about densities, we'll talk about stitch angles, but these are methods you can use yourself with whatever software you have. Um, you're not going to have to digitize on the fly. And in fact, if you download the PDF that I prepared for you guys, uh, that's going to have all the numbers in it. Don't feel weird about writing things down or taking a lot of notes because most of what I say will be in that PDF. Um, if not, there's some articles I've recently released about this that I can share with folks as well uh, that might have a little more detail. Some of these pictures reproduced as well. Um, but this is not something where you need to be sitting. I'm not going to show you to digitize and expect you to start uh, digitizing on the fly either. So uh, no, you don't have to sit by your machine. This is for you to get some theory to uh, get a little bit of the settings that I use and some of the routines that I use, some of the different shapes and things that I'll use in my underlay so that you can have a better result. So if you just kind of watch what's going on, listen to what I'm saying, check out that PDF download in your slides and you'll be able to apply this in any software anytime you want. All right, uh, with that, let me go ahead and continue on with the slides. Um, but yeah, please ask questions. Happy to stop and happy to address those. But yeah, we'll go ahead on the second slide here and we'll just kind of continue on talking about this holistic approach. This is a little bit about the uh, execution side. We're going to get to the digitizing here shortly, though, for those folks who are tuning in just for that. Uh, for right now, the right stuff. Let's talk that first bullet. Well, what I mean is the right foam. We talked about materials being important, but I didn't talk about why. Well, part of the way this thing's going to turn out, if you're going to get show through, which is one of the things that uh, drives people the most crazy about 3D foam, is you'll see a lot of the foam in the edges. You'll see a little, a little of the foam sticking out. One of the ways to get the best prevention of that show through, despite your digitizing, is to make sure that your foam color matches as closely as possible with the top color. Now, uh, that's not available in all foams. You can't get all foams in a, in a large range of colors, but you do want to try and get at least a, a range or a tone that's as close as you can to that top color. If you have something dark, you want a dark foam. If you have something light, you want a lighter foam. And if there's a medium tone in between, that's great too. That may be enough for you, but if you can match closer to the top color um, in the kind of foam that you like to use, that is going to help you a show through. 
also. There are multiple kinds of foam, and you can have a softer foam or a higher density foam. Personally, I talk a lot about the higher density foams because I do prefer them. They tend to tear away a little more cleanly, I find, and I think you get a more square edge, a little bit more edge on the crown. Uh, and when I'm saying crown, what I mean is the amount of a satin stitch, we'll talk about that again later, that sticks up above the garment. When I talk about the crown on any 3D embroidery, that's what I'm talking about, is how high does that stick up and what kind of edge quality do we have on that? With a uh, higher density foam, you're gonna get more of that square edge quality and it'll stay up a little higher, it'll resist compression a little bit more. So if you're trying to get a really high crown, a bit of a crisper edge, you may wanna use a higher density foam. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the right stuff. Your result is partially uh, dependent on the kind of foam you use. When I'm talking about careful embroidery here, I know you say careful embroidery, what does that mean? It's not that you're, uh, there's something you can necessarily do particularly on the machine. It's more that you take into the, all the steps into account and that you uh, watch your first run, you watch your sampling and make notes about what's going on. If you wanna get the best result long-term, especially if you're teaching yourself to digitize for 3D, you're trying to use some of the things that I'm teaching here and apply them for your own shop. Careful embroidery means that you stop, take notice of all the elements and make sure that you are doing everything in a very prescribed manner. And what I mean by that is we don't change too many things at a time. We test on the same kind of materials that we expect our eventual designs to be. If you want to test on hats, it's good to actually test on a hat to find out what that eventual end result will be because the garment is part of this holistic uh, this holistic enterprise. If you have a hat, say, that has a very tough buckram that tends to cause needle deflection, what I mean by that is that the needle bends to the left and right of, say, that, that heavy plastic buckram in the back and causes a little bit of deflection, maybe causes the edges of your embroidery to be a little rough when you're running flat embroidery, it's going to do the same thing with 3D foam. Testing and being careful in your embroidery will help you to understand what's going on when you're trying to refine your technique. So careful embroidery, also part of what we need to do. Be aware, watch what's going on, take notes, and apply that when we're working on your technique. Additional finishing. Uh, we're going to talk more about finishing methods, but like I said before, you must do some additional finishing if you want the best result with foam. Uh, everybody kind of knows about heat. We're going to talk more about heat methods and how you use those, but you're going to have to do some kind of finishing with foam, and it needs to be taken into account uh, both into the time that jobs take and into your pricing if you really want to have this work for the shop. So know that there's going to be some additional finishing for your foam designs. And last but not least, uh, test, test, test. Why do I, I repeat this testing? Uh, people would like to do this all in theory and kind of do it in a vacuum and then run out the first design that's going to go great and it'll go great every time. Fact of the matter is 3D foam can be uh, kind of fickle. I've had problems with designs where I will be several versions into a design working on something, uh, change out the type of foam I'm using, and then the first version works by itself without the alterations I've done. Um, like I said before, every part of this uh, contributes to the final end result. You ha will have to do some testing if you want to learn 3D foam. And the best way to get that kind of uh, in the skin understanding of something, that deep understanding of 3D foam, is to test it and to watch it run like a hawk. When you're watching a machine run, you can very easily see the effect that your digitizing is having, the effect that your materials are having on the finished piece. So watching designs run carefully, testing, making changes in your in your uh, application, making changes in your digitizing, uh, making changes in the way you put the uh, garment together. These things then tested again will give you the results you want and it's all about being careful, taking notes, testing, and then applying that later. So honestly, as someone who taught themselves uh, their initial run of embroidery pretty much entirely on my own after being an operator, uh, that digitizing was all learned by doing diligent testing and taking notes. And with uh, 3D foam, it's uh, doubly important because it can be slightly fickle. Eric, another question that just came in. You mentioned sure. earlier that um, um, the 3D embroidery is immune to whatever software system you use. You can pretty much attempt it with any. A uh, question came in um, that an embroiderer is using old machinery, uh, still using floppy disk. Is there, without being machine specific, is there um, do you see a problem with older machines not being able to do this, or is this pretty much uh, up to the more the operator than the machine? Uh, to be honest, I've seen results on every kind of machine, and actually, as part of doing this entire uh, webinar, 
I have a little home machine that sits in my office, and I, I mean this, a single needle home machine, one of the cheapest you can buy. It's a PE770 from Brother. It's like sub $500. It's not what I would use for a business whatsoever, so I'm not advocating that. However, I have that for putting around in my office, and I ran a piece of Madeira Bodybuilder foam through it and ran one of my commercial designs, and it ran like a dream. So I have seen results on almost every machine, and I've been doing this for so long. In fact, I, very recently I was looking up some of my old articles for this, and I've been teaching this just on Facebook for about six, seven years. <laughs> so on machines throughout this history and in a shop where we had very, very old, honestly, slightly broken machines that were still running, I haven't had trouble with it. The other thing I'm going to be honest with you folks about, I'm not going to talk very much about setting up your machines, and there's actually a really good reason for this. Um, when I've talked to different people about how they set up their machines, I have heard so many conflicting uh, sets of information about what does best for 3D embroidery that I'm going to suggest that you test for yourself. And, and why is this? Because personally, in my shop, we used uh, standard needles, a medium ballpoint 7511 needle, and we didn't change that. Uh, we did not adjust the presser foot height at all in our shop, and we had uh, all the pieces you're going to see today that are mine, and I can point those out, were all done without any alteration to the machines. However, I've talked to people who are in the industry, and I, <laughs> rather than name them since I didn't ask them first, I'll just say that there are people who uh, know machines very well who told me they actually lower the presser foot or change the timing so that it specifically compresses the foam somewhat more when they're running 3D foam and had better results with that. So I have seen results out of so many different setups that I'm not going to tell you one setup does exactly what you want. I'm going to say that it's better to test. Um, certainly we can talk a little bit about thread tensions. People like to reduce thread tensions and thread tension does uh, impact how much you compress foam. Tighter tensions will compress foam down a little bit flatter. However, I've seen good results from so many setups that I'm not going to say one setup is the only setup to do for 3D embroidery. So really this is something where I'll say, you know, get out there. Some of the stitch type stuff is pretty important and is something that reproduces everywhere. Uh, some of the stuff I'll tell you about how to digitize for corners and for junctions is really important and doesn't change very much. But machine setup, machine age, it would be hard to say without knowing your machine and without seeing how you tested it. All right. So with that, why don't we go ahead and <laughs> forge on along, folks. Uh, like I said, this is a topic that uh, everybody has a different opinion on, so I'm not going to be surprised if some of these opinions aren't the same as what you've heard. Um, by all means, get out there and test for yourself, and I would love to hear back from you. So let's go ahead and go through these keys to success. I'm just going to point out quickly that this is a, a design that I did for Madeira USA, actually, and this is something to, to, we did to examine the uh, bodybuilder foam. Um, this tribal heart, um, we'll talk about some of these different elements as we go forward, but you'll see that central heart is done in flat standard embroidery, right? and that the little satin stitch border that's around that heart is at 0.4 density or four points. That's uh, traditional full coverage. You'll see that it's much denser in the way of the foam. We'll be talking about that increased density. You're also going to see the light zigzag underlay that's underwear, under there just a bit. That's something we're going to talk about as well. And this is also what we'll call an angled point way of ending brush strokes. So these strokes, they come to a point so that we don't have to use a lot of capping to get them to tear away the foam. It's another thing we'll talk about. So there's really a lot going on when we're talking about 3D foam embroidery designs. So on this point, you're also going to see this detailed interlace. We have this Celtic knot that's over on the right-hand side, all done in 3D foam, uh, same thick foam that you've seen from the other piece. However, you'll see on that left-hand side, uh, a lot going on in the underlay. I've highlighted the underlay so you can see it. We're going to be talking about junctions and what you you do to prevent things like the foam coming apart, which you do to prevent uh, stitches sinking into the foam at these junction points. And you'll see, once again, that traveling underlay that I did with the large zigzag manual stitches. Uh, once again, a lot of the preparation for foam happens before that top stitching runs. So the more you take into account what needs to happen with that foam before the top stitching runs, the more likely you're going to have a good result on the final piece, even with something so deeply interlaced and detailed as this Celtic knot. Let's talk about the first thing we really need to know about foam uh, digitizing in the first place. It's about stitch type. Um, can you use fill stitches for 3D foam? Uh, absolutely you can. Uh, the thing about fill stitches is though they will run on 3D foam, they tend to drive down the height of the foam somewhat. Uh, this is partially because we've got shorter stitches generally, and even then we have the offset stitches, so we don't really let that foam breathe. It gets compressed quite a bit. And honestly, it can cause a little bit of roughness in the fill stitch. So what you'll often see is some texture in the fill stitch that you may or may not like. So can you do fill stitch with it? Yes, you can. However, if you see this example on the left-hand side, that 
red fill and the black border were all run on the same foam at the same time. This is how much difference there is between the two heights without changing anything except for the stitch type. So when you have a fill on foam, you will find that there's just going to be a little bit lower than a comparable satin stitch on that same foam. So yes, you can do it, but it does drive the height down somewhat. So satin stitches, really, they're, the, they're going to give you the best results and the highest crowns. If you have a customer who sees a satin stitch, big foam letter, they're going to want that. If they see a fill stitch version that's much lower, they're probably going to be less happy than with that big, shiny, high crown that you get on a satin stitch. Also, honestly, the shine on the satin stitch allows for these shadows that you'll see, the highlight and shadow on the edge of the, the crown on that foam, and it makes it pop even more. So most of what we're going to talk about today is really to do with satin stitches and 3D foam, not much with fills. The fill stitch, like I said, doable, drives down the height, sometimes has a bit of roughness on an edge if it doesn't have a capping satin around it. So you can do it, but it is a bit lower and may not be what you want for your customer. On the left-hand side, you see that very classic application of foam, right? So here is that collegiate letter. It's exactly what you might expect it to be. Same thing on the right-hand side, big satin stitches. Look how big and heavy and how tall those crowns are on those things. Really, that's what we're getting out of a satin stitch is what we want from 3D foam. On that left-hand side, you'll see that the double outline was run before the foam was applied. Whenever you have an outline like that, it's often best to run those flat to get that contrast. Uh, if you run it all on the foam, they'll try to be at the same height. You may get some separation. So generally, when you see a piece like this, what you're going to do is digitize and run the outlines actually under the foam. What you can't see there is those satin stitches are actually twice the width that is revealed and are underneath where the foam's going to run. And these are also done at normal densities, not at that heavy density that you're going to see from the foam. So really, when you're talking stitch types, just better to go with that satin. The bolder that satin is, the broader that is, the higher that crown you're going to get from those big open loops. Eric, um, question for you. Sure. Is there a maximum width of the satin stitch when you're using the foam? Um, it depends on your machine and your setup. Uh, I like to keep those things under, you know, about 12, 12 mils, but that's because if you get up to 12 millimeters, your machine is going to do a, a double hook cycle. If you've ever been running a machine, and I know I'm going to do this like onomatopoetically, you'll hear me making sounds, but you hear a machine and suddenly it does this cha-chunk, cha-chunk, <laughs> cha-chunk, and you'll, you know exactly what I'm talking about if you're an embroiderer. What that is is you've gotten over to over a stitch length of about 12 millimeters. That chunking sound is it having to rotate that hook twice before it drops that stitch. Now, you can adjust these things, but um, because, like I said, in my shop, we didn't adjust anything out of the standard. Uh, I usually tried to keep them under that. I usually go, you know, 10 mils. I have seen much wider on caps. I just don't particularly like it, and I think that, uh, especially on the machines I was running, it made things a little less tight, a little less predictable. So, uh, yeah, you can go wide, but I try and keep them under, you know, like a centimeter wide is good, under 12, and that's what I usually do. But once again, your mileage may vary. You can try larger, uh, but you will see that as you get up to that level, um, depending on how your machine set, you'll get those long, chunking, slow stitches. Also, increases machine time and should increase price. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to our next slide, and uh, we'll talk about density. Um, I'm going to be talking about 40 weight thread with the numbers that I'm giving you here. Once again, these will be in the handout, so don't panic if you miss any of these. You can check these out later and uh, get these numbers for yourself. However, what we're looking for is approximately double density, right? So for 40 weight thread, we're going to set the density between about 0.17 millimeters and 0.25 millimeters. That's uh, 1.7 points to 2.5 points. As we know, we've got four points of spacing or 0.4 millimeters on a standard fully filled flat design. Well, 0.2 is about twice that or you know, two points. So we want twice that density. Um, what varies in that? Partially uh, color contrast. If you have a highly contrasting color, you are forced for some reason to have a contrasting color foam from the top stitching. You're probably going to need a little more density to get the coverage you want out of it because that foam will show through, particularly at the corners and edges and points. So consider the color contrast between the thread and the foam when you're setting your density. Um, you do want to use less density if you can. And everybody will say, okay, why would you use less density? Well, if you use too much density, sometimes you'll get a stacking effect. The thread will be trying to stack on top of itself because it really is quite, quite dense. And you'll see a little roughness on the top of your foam crown. So truthfully, I can vary even a little bit outside of this range. This is a good starting range that's likely to give you coverage no matter what you do. Uh, there's also stitch shortening to think about. 
We're going to talk a little bit more about this when we talk about stitch angles, but when you get into tight corners or when you're turning around a round object like an O or see the corner at the top of, a, of an F or any sort of square, you're going to have the inside of that curve is always denser than the outside of the curve. You may want to consider using stitch shortening to keep you from getting that stacking effect in the inner corner. The problem being that when you do that, you will get a little bit of texture in your satin stitch across the foam because of the stitch penetrations that are shorter than the outmost extreme. So stitch shortening is something you can consider if you don't mind the texture or especially if you're on darker colors. Darker colors won't show those shadows as much. If you're doing a black satin stitch, you may not even see them very much. If you're doing a full-on white satin stitch in that same corner, those shadows may be uh, distracting to the look of the foam. So stitch shortening is something to consider on those inner edges of satin stitches. All right, and we can see on this left-hand side, we've got one of those corners I was talking about. And um, because we want, and I'll talk about this more in stitch angles, we want our stitch angle to be perpendicular to the edge of our column. And the reason we want that, we have the shortest distance between the two sides of the column that keeps our stitches tight. It keeps them from loosening up in the foam. It makes things look a little smoother. However, as you can see on this corner, we've gone into the corner pretty sharply. There's no gradual... Uh, move into that angle. And as we've done that, you can see incredibly high densities on the iron curve. Now this particular piece, I elected to go ahead and use uh, stitch shortening, and you can see how there's just this little bit of a lighter area in that inner corner. Uh, the reason why that is, is you'll see that some of the stitches are stopping partially before going all the way out to that inside corner. Um, on this black particular piece of foam that was there, you couldn't see those shadows, but you might have seen them if it were on a lighter piece. Uh, one thing else we're going to preview to is you'll see in the underlay, there's a little zigzag manual cap on the outer corner. Later on, we're going to talk about this. This is the way that we're going to prevent corners from peeking out when we have those long stitches across that angle. Uh, that's something we'll talk about more in underlay, but I just wanted to point it out here so you can get a preview of what's going to be talked about later. Eric, I'm, I'm going to interrupt again. Um, sure. We do have a couple questions coming in about underlay, but I know that you're going to get to that, so I think you're going to answer those. Okay. But this is a, an interesting question that I know we haven't discussed before. Is there ever a time in a design when you would want the foam to contrast with the thread? Uh, you know, I have not particularly done that. Um, I can imagine where somebody might want to show the foam through to cause a distressed look. Uh, it'd be an interesting look to try, and honestly, if somebody wants to get back to me with pictures, I'd love to <laughs> I'd love to talk to you about it and try it out. Uh, I have also seen, and this is kind of off the bead, uh, there are people who use laser bridge machines that are you know, mounted lasers on machines for cutting that will run a small edge just holding down foam and then cut out the foam and leave the foam open as a decoration itself. Um, totally different thing than what we're doing here. Very cool looking. I wish I actually had a sample to show you guys right now. Uh, for that, I can totally imagine using contrasting colors. Um, other than that, no. I mean, if you want the foam color to be hidden, the best way to do that is to get close to your top stitching color. But otherwise, you're likely to see it on the corners and edges and points that you come to because it'll be a little bit of spreading, especially on uh, longer stitches. They want to spread out. So if you wanted to use a non-contrast, it will show in those areas. And maybe you could get kind of a cool distressed look out of it. It's just something I haven't tried. So uh, kudos to our listener who uh, <laughs> brought yes. something to me that I haven't actually harassed. <laughs> All right. Uh, were there any other questions or should I get on? Uh, nope, we can keep going. The only right, other great. request is that you try to talk a little bit slower. I know you've got <laughs> a, t a ton of information. Um, I should have mentioned that if we run over the hour a little bit, uh, we in our practice session we did, but only by five or ten minutes. So um, I know that Eric has tons and tons of information to share, but I know that because of that, um, it's helpful if you can slow your roll just a little bit. <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you. Uh, I'll go ahead and let everybody know I'm I'm willing to stay a little longer. And of course, there will be the the um, if you have to get back to work. There will be the recording later. So absolutely check into that. So let's slow down a little bit the density. I talked about how the inner corners of the density uh, can get a little tight. You can see in this piece how tight they are. And over on the right hand side, though I think this is a successful piece, what I want you to look at is that there's a little bit of texture, a little bit of rippling in those satin stitches. And what that is due to is an excess of density. Uh, and partially from some interference from the cap below. Uh, what The cap that that's on is a flex fit cap and it has a really, really dense support structure inside of it. That plastic causes some needle deflection. Uh, in order to combat that, we had to use a little extra density to try and make sure we weren't getting uh, gaps and breaks in that foam. 
but the extra density also caused us to have that stacking effect I was talking about. So you'll see kind of on the top of that D that's facing us, there's a little bit of texture that is uh, frankly a little undesirable. Uh, that can happen when you use excess density, so you want to balance your densities and test if you can. I know we can't always test on garments or test repeatedly, but it is good to test when you can to try and keep those densities lower, especially when your foam color does match your top stitching. All right, so stitch angles. Here's why stitch angles are important. On this left-hand side, I'm going to display exactly how much difference you can get from that inner corner to the outer corner, especially if you're not being particularly careful with how you set your angles. You have to balance the stitch angle with the inner edge density. We do want that perpendicular stitch path. We want our stitch angle to take the shortest path across the column as we can. Like I said, keeps the stitches looking tight. They won't lay over at an oblique angle and get loose or have texture. However, trying to keep them perpendicular when you have a much smaller inner gap than an outer curve means you're going to have a lot higher density on the inside edge. So we have to use gentler transitions to try and stop that from happening in the corners. Uh, as you can see here, this person I was trying to help out with a design that was breaking thread on the inner edge of this particular letter. Out at the outside edge, they've measured their density. It is correct. It is 0.2 density. It's two points. So it's exactly what we want to get our coverage. However, as you see, in the lighter section on the inner side, we're already at double that density on the inner edge. And in that highest density point, we're at 0.04. That's an incredibly high density there. What we're having is the needle was coming back and cutting previous stitches. It's trying to fall into the same penetrations that it's already made. It's incredibly high. It will bind up the machine. It will cause numerable <laughs> problems when you're running. So when you have stitch angles like this, you have to loosen them up somewhat, and it does mean taking a longer path along the column than you might want to, ideally. So we have to use gentler transitions and get a careful balance between those angles and the density. You may have to use a slightly uh, lower density in general. You may have to go toward the outer edge of that coverage that you want, especially if you have foam that matches. And you want to move those angle points on the inside a little further apart so that they are you have a gentler transition into any angle. As you can see here, there is a really sharp transition from that point where it was at 0.1 density to where it was at 0.04, the stitch angles were set so that the inner points were just right together on the inclination lines. You really don't want that. If you can avoid it, it will cause thread breaks, it will cause problems because you're already working at such a high density. So despite the fact that we want that perpendicular uh, stitch angle, you do need to balance that with a gentler transition to get away from having that extra density on the inside edge. Now you could certainly use one, once again, a stitch shortening to try and avoid some of this, but it will have texture, and on a piece that's in white thread, you'll definitely see that texture on the inner edge. Eric, a question um, about tension that I guess would fit in here as well as any place else. In mm -hmm. previous webinars, um, our embroider, Nancy Minnie, has um, taught that when you look at the underside of an embroidery, um, the if the tension is correct, you should see one third top, then one third bobbin thread, and then another third um, top thread. And the question is, does that still, does that rule still apply when you're doing 3D embroidery? Uh, somewhat, but you want lo uh, looser densities in general. Okay. So you'll, the balance can still be the same with the densities being looser overall. However, as I said previously in, in the shop that I ran, I did not adjust densities that much or uh, rather tensions. I didn't adjust the tensions that much. So frankly, though you can adjust tensions, you may get a slightly higher crown doing so. Uh, I did not do a lot of uh, tension adjustment in my own shop when I was working that. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean you cannot or that it doesn't have an effect. It's just that I found that the effect wasn't uh, pronounced enough for me to do that for everything. If I were setting up a shop, let's say that you have dedicated machines that are running hats and 3D embroidery constantly, uh, instead of like we were, where we would occasionally run 3D uh, garments in between a lot of other normal runs, maybe you would adjust it more frequently than we did, or we would adjust right before we did a large production run of just 3D designs. But honestly, it was not a heavy adjustment. But yeah, the balance, you still want the balance to be similar. Though I have found, just due to the fact that we're working on these uh, these very different tensions and we do have a lot of friction going on here, that you may see it be a little more erratic with foam than you do with flat embroidery. It doesn't mean anything's going particularly wrong, but I've, I've seen that being a little bit different than you would have had it adjusted otherwise, as far as the balance. Okay. 
Eric, for embroiderers who are not digitizers, um, yes. question is, will they be able to, to run 3D embroidery on designs that, um, that they've got that, that without doing redigitizing? No. Uh, 3D embroidery, absolutely, you must be digitized for it. Now, don't get me wrong. If you throw 3D foam underneath a satin stitch and it's fairly dense, sometimes you can get something that looks okay. Um, usually you're going to be far too loose on your densities. You're not going to get enough coverage. Your edges are going to look pretty poor. Um, the best opportunity you have is to use 3D foam with digitized design specifically for 3D foam. The good thing you can do if you have a digitizer who uh, is willing to work with you on these things, as long as your you know, satin strokes are bold, it is possible to change the design to edit it to make it more, more friendly for 3D foam, but really ideally you want your design to be digitized for 3D foam for the start. Okay, and one, even with stock designs, you will find stock design houses sometimes will have 3D foam designs as part of their uh, stable designs. So I would look for it certainly before you before you try and use it on anything else. One last question, and then I'll I sure. won't interrupt for a while more. Um, uh, no worries. There was a question that came in from from someone about which hats, which caps you would choose to embroider on. Um, they mentioned a brand that they were having trouble with, and while I don't want to ask you to, to put down <laughs> hat companies, I wondered if there are any cap companies that you have had particularly good luck with. Uh, I'll be honest and say that it depends on the style of hat individually as well within the brand. So rather than talk about the particular brand of hat, I will just say these are the things I look for. Okay, um, in a structured you. hat, even if the hat is structured and has a fairly uh, strong structure in it, the buckram, that panel that is supporting the front of that cap, I want that to be a little bit pliable. And if I'm running, you know, if I'm running regular designs on it, and I'm having thread breaks where I see a lot of deflection where I get, say, sawtoothing, I get roughness on the edge of my satin stitches because that buckram is pulling the needle back and forth. That's something I don't want to use, and I definitely don't want it for 3D embroidery because that's just additional difficulty. Um, if you've got a cap that likes to break needles or break thread every time you run over the center seam, that probably has a little bit too stiff a buckram. Um, I particularly think that we've got such a wide range of caps out there that ordering from some different brands will get you similar looking caps that may have a lighter feel to them. Once again, I don't want to particularly, like, like we said, we don't want to throw anybody under the bus or necessarily give you exactly the cap that's the best. Um, but I would look for caps where that, that buckram is a little bit more pliable. You can bend it in your hands and it doesn't, it doesn't cause you any trouble with your normal flat embroidery. And that's going to be the one you want to work with. Honestly, um, if you have to go down to tricks like steaming or, or uh, man, you know, mechanically manipulating the hat to get it to run because the seam is so stiff or because the buckram is causing you that deflection or needle problems, um, definitely don't then add to that the extra complication of double the density in 3D foam. So I know that's not that's kind of a non-answer answer, but that is what I look for generally. And in fact, if you look at the piece, a lot of people say they really hate running on unstructured hats. That super heavy uh, initial, that collegiate A that we showed earlier, that's on a fully unstructured hat. So you can do it on unstructured hats. Uh, the thing that, with that is just making sure it's very well stabilized. I used a nice heavy uh, tearaway with that, and I was on a 270 degree frame, and I made sure that the tearaway went from post to post from one back post to the far back post. So I had a nice cylinder of backing there, a nice cylinder stabilizer that held that hat together. So if you stabilize correctly, you'll be able to run unstru even unstructured hats with 3D foam. So is that all the uh, questions for this particular section? Um, actually, there is one more on stitch angles. Right. When you thin out sure. the inner angle, the outer yes. angle can get too open um, frequently. Is there any advice for that? Actually, in what I'm talking about, you can leave the outer angle alone. Um, I'm not talking about just opening up everything. The outer angle is alone. You're just trying to move the points on the inner angle further apart. It just means that you make the transi transition over a longer length ac across the entire satin stitch. So instead of starting very close to the corner, you want to start further out transitioning from one angle to the corner angle. Um, and if that doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense, it means that, say in that corner that we saw earlier, instead of being at 90 degrees and then immediately transitioning to 45, you're going to start transitioning at an angle further down the stroke. Um, and that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about having a balanced, gentle transition. So that wouldn't change the outer angle. Um, certainly, if you're talking about just trying to reduce the density overall, yeah, reducing the density overall will reduce the outer density. But I'm saying don't necessarily reduce the density that much, um, maybe a little bit just to help you achieve that inner density that you need uh, to reduce that. But really, you're just talking about making a little bit more of a gentle angle. Um, you're still going to be higher on the inner density than you probably want to be.
truth of the matter, you can't avoid that entirely. However, we're just trying to make it more balanced so that you don't encounter thread breaks and lumping up of thread the way that we had in this particular design. Okay. So with that, why don't we go ahead and just transition briefly into uh, strokes. This is a pretty easy thing to say. Uh, we're looking at the same foam on the left-hand side as the right-hand side. Bold, thicker strokes are going to give you a higher crown than a thinner stroke if you don't make any other adjustments. So as you can see, even on that right-hand side, there's that tap, the little gray tap that's at the bottom of this stylized barrel with the Celtic knotwork on it. As you see that the stroke for that tap, it's the same piece of foam that's underneath that green Celtic knotwork. Well, you see how it, how much higher it stands above? That is literally just a function of how wide that uh, that particular satin stitch is. So a bolder, thicker stroke will give you a bit of a higher crown. The longer, loose loops of threads tend to allow for a little bit of loosening of tension that will allow the crown to be higher. So thicker lines are going to give you a higher crown. You can still create depth on a thinner line. It's just going to be a little bit closer to the garment without any other adjustments uh, than you would have from the thicker stroke. All right, so underlay. <laughs> this is where a lot of my technique will vary from other people. Uh, you'll see people try to pre-cut the foam with uh, straight stitches that are along the inner edge with edge runs. You'll see people who do uh, multiple passes to try and hold down the foam with uh, tighter zigzags or build up to the top density, and I don't tend to do any of that. I use as little underlay as possible when I'm running 3D foam, and I'll kind of talk about why. First, what I do with the underlay. I do want it to tack the foam into place, even though we may use something like an embroidery specific adhesive or we might tape our foam on the sides to hold it down while we're starting to run. Um, I do like to use a little bit of these long zigzags that you've seen before, these long manual zigzags across the column to hold down the foam, tack it into place before we start running top stitching. The other things I'll do functionally, I want to make things that we call planks. We're actually gonna talk about these caps and planks. These planks are where top stitching columns meet it keeps foam from being cut. Say you have one column, the next column that runs over it cuts the foam that's already there. Sometimes you'll have stitches fall into that cut or you'll have the two pieces of foam try to separate and you'll have some uh, strange texture in that junction. I try to prevent that by using planks of long underlay stitches to hold that foam together after the second sit, the satin column goes over the top of the original one. We also have caps. In the underlay run before the, stop, the, the top stitching runs, We'll have caps to cover the open ends and something that's not mentioned here, points to uh, perforate little points at the ends of uh, pointed strokes. But the reason I don't use what I call excess underlay, why do I go without edge runs? You'll see this piece on the left-hand side. Uh, this was in a Facebook post I was helping some folks out with, I, or at least I commented on. We were all trying to help this person with the texture they're getting at the bottom of this lightning bolt. It's like the word flash, lightning bolt forms the S, but on that bottom section, you see those lumps that are sticking out of the side of this 3D foam. Well. Though we're doing all right on the rest of the columns, some interaction between the cap, between the way the underlay was set up, and the top stitching allowed those little edge run pieces to pop outside of the foam edge. Now, as you can see, other strokes that are above that, it looks fine. So it's not that you can't use that underlay and get this to work. However, it's much more likely for one of these to escape and ruin the edge quality of your foam if you're using that edge underlay. So for me, I elected never to pre-cut the foam and to cut the foam only with the top stitching. Like I said, it isn't something you can't make work. Just in my practice, I found that it was much more likely to end up with a reject, to end up with uh, spoilage because of these little loops sticking out. Also, they often carried a little piece or a chunk of the foam with them when they did this, when they tipped out. And this is something you can't really trim out or correct. So these pieces are usually lost. A customer's not gonna accept these big lumpy edges on 3D foam. It's just not the look we want. So for me, I consider that to be excess underlay and I don't use it at all in my pieces. Eric, I'm gonna interrupt you and give you a <laughs> chance to take a breath with sure. a, couple, a couple more questions. Um, Absolutely. One um, digitizer wrote in, can you space um, stack or overlap satin stitches in order to obtain a wider 3D look? Uh, I have seen people do that. Um, it, it does work plenty fine, but there is some texture involved. So what I would say, I would test it on a particular foam you like to see how much you get. There's a little bit of crushing that can happen when you do that. Um, it does make a rippled texture. Not everybody loves the texture. So yes, you can, um, it, but it does especially because the foam will kind of compress under the first satin as it goes, and it may be a little bit different between them. Um, I found that that texture um, 
it's an interesting texture you might use if a customer's not ready for it, doesn't like it, or even use like say a split satin that has a random split in it. Some customers don't like that extra kind of crushing that happens in the middle through the run. So it may it may not be a texture you love, but yeah, you can do it. But once again, you also can use a you can use a fill as well. I mean, these are things you can do. I've also seen people use uh, applique on top of foam to try and hold the foam up or to uh, essentially create a plank with an applique on top of it where the fabric it covers up the foam. You can do that too. These are all possibilities that just take a little bit more work when you're doing something that's kind of non-standard to get your settings just right. Um, how about auto spacing? Do you ever do that or do you prefer specific density settings? Um, I would never use auto spacing because what's going to happen is it's going to change it as we get uh, thinner and thicker and it may change the amount of coverage. Uh, for 3D foam, I don't like it. Um, personally, I want to control that spacing. Um, I just think that you're having a, you'll have a, l a lot higher chance of uh, having some show through that you don't expect and then you can't control it. So personally, I like to control those variables myself. Okay. Um, okay, we'll let you move on. All right. <laughs> I know we have a lot of questions, folks. I, I promise that I'll answer as many as I can. So let's talk a little bit about the underlay one more time here. This is just a little bit of illustration from the points that we talked about earlier. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have the cap and plank, and these are the kind of basic units I talk about when I'm, I'm talking about the functional part of the underlay. Um, that cap is to cap any of the open ends of satin stitches. As you see, it's ragged on the inside so that it does not perforate on the inside. Not everybody does that. We'll talk about why later. You'll also see on the cap in the corners, this particular piece had foam that uh, I had to use and did not like to tear away cleanly. And unlike some of the foam we've had from Madeira, and you'll, you may like some of the other foam better than what I was using at the time, I used these small corner points that you can see underneath the cap to cut away the corners before I pulled those out so that I could still have a nice perpendicular edge on that cap, but I could cut the points out and I didn't have to poke them in manually in the finishing process. Also, as you see the cat, that plank, it's just long zigzag manual stitches that don't line up on the edge that hold those two pieces of foam together and provide a platform for the stitching that's underneath. On the left-hand side, you're going to see a piece that instead of having open edge satins, it has what we're gonna call angled points where we draw the shapes out to a tapered point so that we don't have to have a cap in our uh, to, in order to cut the foam away. What you can see that's different about that is there are small points that I've used to perforate that end. Once again, just helps us with our finishing. You don't always need these, but some foam will try to poke out of those small tapers. And you'll see on the upper left-hand corner, that little corner cover I, tr I talked about earlier. Once again, this piece, I left the angles as they were because on that dark foam, I was able to use shortened stitches in those tight angles, and I didn't have to balance it in order to get what I thought was a pretty good result. However, your mileage may vary. You may want to use a much uh, looser, more gradual transition. In fact, if I did this piece again, I would use a more gradual transition because those corners tried to pull in a little bit more than I liked. So let's go on forward to the next slide. We've got our end caps. So why do we need end caps? We have to cut away the foam from the edges of any of these open uh, satin stitches. As you can see in the bottom of this A, those are all big open letters. Those, co those collegiate letters have that big open satin stitch. I did elect on the top to go ahead and turn the satin around the corners to avoid having to cap the top of that letter. However, on the bottom, you can see those are caps on all the ends of those bottom serifs. Now, if we were trying not to do that, we could have used stitch angle and had tapers on that, but I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of using stitch angles to taper to the corner corners a little bit later. It causes more distortion that you may not like in the shapes, especially on something like this that's very straight, very rectilinear. It's a rectangle and you don't want to see pulling in the corners. You don't want to see pushing out of those tapers. That's why on this piece I elected to use a nice cap. So we'll use a satin stitch cap to cut that foam underneath before we run the top stitching. What this does, partially it keeps the top stitching in place. Uh, if you have an end cap, and you allow for the push compensation, the next bullet point that's there, you have to have that end cap out a little bit further than the actual end of the satin stitch. Why is this? Well, we're gonna stack our density up on those, you see those serifs down there, and it's going to push out to the outer edges, just like any satin stitch does, that satin stitch will get longer than it is on screen. We can have up to half a millimeter of exposure of that cap, but when you actually run the design, you'll see that that cap covers right to the edge. So. What we're trying to do is keep the top stitching in place. We want that end cap to stick out further than the top stitching satin so that it has a place for those satin stitches to ride. You'll see that if you don't adjust for that, 
If you don't allow those end caps to stick out a little further, the satin stitches will go over that edge and you'll have a waterfall effect. They'll just start to fall over and you have loose loops that are hanging out of the end of your satin stitch uh, stroke. You don't want that. So to, to avoid for that, you want to make sure that your end cap sticks out on screen further than it needs to, further than it looks like it needs to on the finished piece. The other thing we're going to avoid is what I call tip out. The reason why I have a ragged edge on the inner edge of my satin stitch end caps is to keep that piece from perforating on the inside edge. If you see somebody show you how to do 3D foam and they use a standard satin stitch, what they sometimes do, especially if they don't make that end cap wide enough, they'll have tearing away on the inside edge of the foam and that little satin stitch cap can tip out. It can actually rotate a little bit. The foam will come separate and the end cap will poke out of the column and some of the top stitching will fall in behind that end cap. That's what I call tip out. The way I avoid that is to keep that ragged edge on the inside of the end cap so that you don't get a clean perforated line. Now this is the other way that we can avoid these large open ends. And this is called angled points, or at least I've called this angled points. A lot of these things you're going to find different digitizers call them different things. But all this is is tapering each satin stitch element from one corner to another so that you end on these small stitches and that every edge has perforation along that edge so that you can tear things away. Now, it does have pros and cons. The pro, you don't have to put elaborate caps in place. Now, I've decided on this particular piece to put in what I call points, and I've told you earlier, these little arrowhead shapes. It's so that I can drop just a couple of stitches in that corner to make it easier to tear away so that I don't have as much finishing to do on the final piece. However, on some of these strokes, you may not need these little points. This is me being very careful to keep my uh, costs down in the finishing department. However, with really small stitches, sometimes you can just tear that foam away, and especially if you don't mind manually poking in little bits of foam when it occasionally happens, you may not use, have to use caps at all. However, the con can be that if we all understand push and pull compensation, the ends of these satin stitches are going to push toward those little end tapers, those flat ends, and it's going to pull toward the center of the column. As we know, the stitch is going to try and get shorter. So what does this mean for this particular piece? You may have the bottom left-hand corner that we see there get a little further into the center. You may see some distortion of the shape. And on something like, say, the square, those very rectangle serifs on the bottom of that collegiate letter, you may find that you end up with kind of a parallelogram. You'll have the top two of the corners will pull in, two of the corners will push out, and your angles will look a little funny. Uh, you can adjust for it, but it does mean you have to adjust for it when you're using the angled point method of closing off an element. The other thing you'll see here is another thing that I've done, the underlay. Um, I've made these little manual zigzags over those long corners. You see in the upper right-hand corner and the bottom left-hand corner of the element on the left-hand side. What that is is to avoid peek through or poke through. And what that is, when you run a piece like this and you have these long stitches that don't follow that short angle path, where the stitches are longest, they'll become a little loose. And where you have the foam coming to a sharp point as it becomes perforated by the outer shape, that sharp point wants to stick out. It wants to separate those threads that are above it and poke through, and they often do. And heat applying, applying heat alone won't usually keep them down. However, if we use these little cover corners that I've showed you here, these little zigzags, sometimes you can compress that point down just a little bit literally sew it down to the element, to the cap or to the garment, and then the satin stitches and the top stitching will ride over top of the, that little corner, those little zigzags, and keep from those corners poking out of the end product. The thing is that generally only happens when you're using this model. Um, anytime you have an angle where you get to that kind of 45, you have those really long stitches, it's not going across that short angle. It'll tend to be a little looser, and with the corners, as we see here, they just want to pop through once they get free, once they get torn away from the rest of the body of the foam. So that's another thing that kind of is a con for angled points, but I mean, overall, it's kind of an easier way to digitize for foam. It's easier to get the foam torn away. However, it does mean you have to compensate for these other cons. So junction points. Let's talk briefly about junctions. Uh, when I'm talking about a junction, all I mean is any time we're two of these satin stitch columns meet. Uh, could be end to end, could be side to side. We do have to do something to keep the foam together, particularly if we want these satin stitches all to be at the same level and to stay as a cohesive unit. So part of what we're trying to avoid is tear out or separation. You'll find that sometimes, say at a T-junction, uh, we've run the 
say the vertical arm of the T that's coming up, the vertical body of the T, that spine, when you go to run the top of the T, the top column will cut the bottom foam and separate that top piece from the bottom piece. And it means the stitches fall inside, then we have some separation, we may see foam through that joint where it pulls the bottom stitches apart. We want to avoid that. You want to maintain interlaces. As you saw in the Celtic knot example earlier, I wanted all of that foam to pretty much be at the same height, and I didn't want to see deep cuts where every one of those junctions happened. In order to try and keep that foam around the same height and keep the, the thread from falling in at every one of the junctions, I went ahead and used planks to maintain the interlace and keep those junctions together, keep the foam from falling apart. You also have in column junctions. What I mean by this is when you have a column stitch or a satin stitch column that ends in the center, what I mean is you start on one side and it fills to one point, goes out to the other end, fills back to some point in the middle of that stroke, you're going to have a small place that joins, an in-column junction, where those two ends of the satin stitches, essentially what you're making is two satin stitches, even though digitizing program had one element, those butt together. When you do that, you're going to have a little bit of overlap. However, pretty frequently, because the other satin stitches around it have compressed the foam, you will find that the last little bit of foam as you go to close those two things up is sticking up a little bit proud of the rest of the foam and it wants to poke through that junction. In order to stop that junction, I will tend to put a small plank down in that area to keep it held down. So let's talk briefly about the M80 design you just looked at. Uh, I've highlighted on the left-hand side the underlay that was in that particular section. This is the right-hand leg of the M as it translates into the 8. And as you'll see, uh, in the center there is a in-column junction. On that right-hand stroke, it starts filling from the bottom, goes up to the top, and then fills back down into that center point where you see the underlay. I've put a small plank there. Now, this is one of my very early foam designs. I actually probably would have made the edges a little more jagged, but they're still far enough apart on that zigzag that you won't get a good solid perforation. What you do have here, though, is that zigzag just holds down the foam enough and covers enough to allow that top stitching to ride on top of it and keep the foam from poking through. On the right-hand side, you'll see where the junction is, that little bright line. Often you'll see in 3D previews from software uh, where there's an in-column junction, there'll be that little bright line at your end point. That's a good place. That's right the center of where you want this plank to be. Uh, what you'll also see is that I wanted the eight not to tear away from the M. I wanted those to move as one unit. And just above the plank that I used to fix that in-column junction is just a little zigzag to hold those two pieces of foam together. Once again, just to stop the tearing away in the separation. And here's the, the you know, mother of all junctions. There's all of those junctions that I did for the uh, 3D foam piece for the Celtic knot. Now, as you can see, instead of doing an individual zigzag for each place where there's an overlap, because we had such thin satin columns, I went ahead and used one big plank to cover uh, two of the joins at a time. Uh, once again, why did I do this? I didn't want the stitches to fall in. I wanted them all to ride about at the same height. And I didn't want, especially in the center of some of these pieces, for there to be an isolated small chunk of foam that became entirely cut away from the rest of the foam that was there. Um, by using these junction planks, it essentially stitches the foam together before it gets cut by the top stitching to keep it from floating apart and to keep that level at the same height. Now, most of the time, you're not going to be doing this much work in the junctions. Uh, that point up there, that, that is quite intense compared to most 3D foam. What you're usually going to see is what you have on the right-hand side. This is the top of a junction with a B, a classic kind of semi-scripty B from a baseball hat. The only thing you'll see there is one very simple plank. It's just a manual zigzag stitch, ragged on both sides just to hold those two pieces of foam together. And then you'll see a point at the top, once again, just to help me to clean up that foam, to tear it away so that even with that taper, I don't have a little chunk of foam that sticks out. Uh, that particular one is a little extra heavy. This foam that I was using was quite uh, tacky. It didn't like to rip away. So I used that nice heavy point and let it stick out just a little bit further. Once again, you see I'm accounting for that push compensation so that that satin column and the final top stitching just covered that point. Eric, uh, just a question specifically about the planks. What length sure. of running stitch are you using or are you using a satin stitch for the planks? Uh, neither, these are manual stitches. And I know that sounds a little scary that I'm doing them one at a time. Um, but I'm trying to keep them quite long. I want them to be, you know, four millimeters if I can. I want them to be long. Four or more would be good. Um, 
sometimes I'll keep them under four on small pieces just because that keeps the machine running at the same speed. It doesn't slow down depending on machines that are set to slow down after a certain length. Um, but I try and keep them pretty long as long as I can with them being comfortable just because I want them to uh, remain unbroken and not show through any of the top stitching. So really it's not a particular length. Each one of those zigzags you see that is one stitch point from each point of the zigzag to the next. So they're, they're all manually done. Now you could, uh, if you wanted to, say you had a plank like this, you could use a satin stitch uh, and you could uh, set your density so it was nice and open. Uh, on this particular piece, I think that's probably two millimeters. I'm not looking at it right now, but say you had a two millimeter density, very open satin there, uh, set the edges to be jagged on both sides. You could enter those planks by using a satin stitch tool to enter them. Uh, for me, because I like to travel and do my underlay at the same time, uh, well, you have to really travel and do your underlay at the same time. I find it just as quick, especially with simple pieces, to use a manual stitch and do it all manually myself. Uh, that probably answers another question, which is, are you, <laughs> are you digitizing your own zigzag stitching, or is that coming from the machine software? Uh, I am not using automated zigzag. Uh, you could use it for certain things if you wanted to, but I'm going between different columns. Um, when there's a ton, ton of junction points, especially like something very uh, detailed like we have in the interlace here, you're going to have to cover all those junctions before you start doing much of this, the stitching because you have to have it before either of the top stitching elements that will be that will meet at that junction run, the underlay already has to be present. If the plank isn't there before both of those pieces run, it's not there to support uh, the design and it's also going to be on top of the lower piece. So it has to run before either of the pieces in the junction are present, which means doing it automatically doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you couldn't really do that with the satin stitch itself very easily um, unless you were using uh, a setting that made it pop out further than the edge of the uh, column. And you can you can do things like that. For me, I find the control is better and then I get a better result by doing it manually myself and uh, planning ahead. Now, not the best answer. It means more work. Digitizers, I know. Um, but it, I've found that for my money, I, w I was more about wanting to control the production methods and make sure that I had the cleanest output. Um, because a lot of the time what ended up happening, if I didn't do that, the more shortcuts I took, I would have more spoilage on the machines and more and more uh, finished time at the end. So for me, for my money, uh, it was great to do the manual stuff and to plan it ahead and have a lot of control. All right, so let's go on to corners a little bit. Uh, we don't, we've already talked a bit about this, so we don't have to belabor the point, haha. -ha. But here we have these points and the corner covers again as we've had. Uh, we're preventing poke through again. Uh, we're both having what we, we call poke through, which is where that sharp, sharp cut corner, as we see on the bottom of that left-hand side example, where we have that sharp corner that is torn away, starts to poke through the long stitches. We're gonna cover that up with a manual zigzag across that end and it's perpendicular, as you can see, to the top stitching. It goes in the opposite angle to the top stitching to keep that from riding out and from poking through. Uh, and it also provides support to that long top stitching. But you're also going to see the little point on the left hand, or on the far right hand side, rather, of the left image. And that point, once again, is just a small perforation. It's, it's about three stitches just to provide some small point to tear away that e excess little point that sticks out so that I don't have to poke that chunk of foam back into the tapered end when we're done with the corner. So really all we're doing here, once again, it's the same sort of methods we're using everywhere else. Uh, zigzag stitches across the foam to hold it down in any place that it wants to poke through. And we're perforating the foam along the edge and adding a couple little more needle points to that corner just to make it easier to tear away in the end and and kind of just stop ourselves from having to do a lot of manual work and finishing. So really, that's all we're doing here. Once again, we're just managing that foam before we run the top stitching. And here we get to finishing. Now, we've talked all about the digitizing, and honestly, if you've done the stuff we've talked about so far, you're going to have a pretty good finished result when you pull that foam off. But there are always going to be small fibers of foam around the edge. There are always going to be little chunks of foam that stick out, and Though I think it's important to go ahead and watch your design run, see if there are things you can do, like those small corner points that I inserted, or the little corner covering around runs that I did, to keep the foam from poking out, sometimes you're going to have an occasional piece where the foam just doesn't uh, rip away that you want it to, or some way that you ripped it pulls a piece out, and at the end, finishing is just the last chance you have to make that look clean. First thing always, heat is key. However, you have to be very careful applying heat to your 3D foam pieces. Uh, I prefer an adjustable heat gun 
Uh, people sometimes will use hair dryers. It will use all forms of heat. An adjustable heat gun lets you dial it down. You want to start low. You want to move across the design. You don't want to keep anything in one spot. So you have to have a really careful application. You have to watch what it's doing and be careful with the piece. Heat will shrink the foam somewhat. Small fibers will shrink in under the foam or under the edges of the thread, and it will help to tighten up the design in general. However, you have to be careful with your fibers. Uh, polyester doesn't take the heat the way rayon does. It will shrink. It will burn. It will melt. If you apply too much heat, if you apply heat for too long, you can damage your garment, damage your embroidery. Uh, you can damage the foam itself. It, you just want to be very careful, very ginger with how you apply heat. Also, if you're working on light colors, especially white, you have to be careful not to scorch. If you use too much heat, if you apply it too directly too long, you can scorch those and end up with uh, browning on those designs on those pieces. And you have to be very careful not to ruin all your hard work up to this point. So consider the fiber you're working on, consider the application. Uh, the other thing I'm gonna warn you about, I worked in a multi-decoration shop. And so what they thought would be a great idea, let's start throwing these through the gas screen printing dryer. It turns out that hats sit up a little higher than you might expect and they scorched a ton of hats. So <laughs> think about what you, how you're applying the heat. For me, manual application uh, with an adjustable heat gun is probably the best bet. The other thing you'll have to do sometimes is what I call mechanical intervention. Uh, this is a very fancy way for saying we're going to poke in the bits of foam that stick out. Uh, if you have a large piece of foam that's sticking out of a corner or sticking out of an edge, sometimes you want to just poke that back in and it really doesn't affect the end result. It's not something that's a, it's not a dirty word. You know, you don't have to feel bad that you had to poke a piece of foam back in. If you poke something back in and you rub the area above it, apply a little bit of light abrasion. Once again, I'm using technical terms for something that's not very technical. You can move those threads around and it'll sit on top of that foam and keep the piece in that's poking out. Um, frankly, you'll even find that sometimes you'll have coverage that looks a little spotty or you'll have a little bit of roughness in a column and running the back of your thumbnail across that column, applying just a little bit of pressure will sometimes even out those threads and make it look okay, especially if it's just an occasional thing. Uh, absolutely, look at your design. Make sure your densities are where they need to be. Look at your underlay and make sure that that's okay. So it's not that you don't want to adjust for these things, especially if that's poking out. You have a corner that pokes out on every run all the time. Go back to your digitizing, adjust for it. Uh, tell your digitizer if you're using one who's doing this stuff for you how to tack that down or tell them where that's going on and show them a picture of the result. Um, go ahead and correct it. But when it's one piece, there's nothing wrong with taking something uh, and poking that back in. But what I will talk about is what we use to poke these things back in. <laughs> on the left-hand side, you'll see toothpicks. Um, lots of people use things like uh, skewers or toothpicks or any sort of thing that's thin will fit in there to poke that back in. However, what I would caution you to do is to use something that's semi-blunt and smooth. Uh, you want nothing that's going to catch on the thread. We have these long, loose loops of satin stitch. We all know what happens if you snag a satin stitch and it gets cut. Uh, that's a ruined garment. You can't sell this thing. You're, even if you fray check it, you're going to have funny edges or ends, and it might want to unravel on you. So don't do the thing that a lot of us do. We're holding a trimmer. That's why we have a scissor there with a big band sign on it. I've done this multiple times. You're holding a trimmer to finish your design out. You see a little piece of foam sticking out. You take the blade and you poke the foam back in. It may happen, you know, 99 times out of 100, you don't do it, but you can cut that top thread with the edge of that blade, especially if you have a nice sharp scissor like we're showing here. Uh, I just say don't risk it. Get yourself like a small gauge needle, anything that's smooth that you can poke that in with that's not going to cut the thread. So be careful with mechanical intervention. <laughs> it's okay to go ahead and take a piece of backing or something and rub and push a little bit to get those satin stitches evened out. It's okay to poke a piece in, but just watch what you're using when you start working on that piece. You don't want to spend all that machine time to end up cutting the thread at the last second. Eric, a question I know you're, you're going to want to answer quickly <laughs> yeah. um, is how far from the, uh, from the item would you hold uh, the, the heat gun? This question is coming from an embroiderer who's been using a lighter to accomplish this. <laughs> you know what, I've used a lighter many a time. I'm not gonna curse you out for doing it. In fact, the the colorful term I came up with for that was fire polishing. So you know that I've done this oh. a few times myself. It sounds um, very professional. It sounds very professional, but it, it does often end up with burnt threads. Uh, with the heat gun, I'd hold it a few inches, like, like four to seven inches away. I don't know that I have a great number for you, but don't put it in real close. Don't touch it to the garment. Hold it far away and move in. Honestly, your eyes will tell the tale. You'll see the little bits of foam start to shrink up as you get to the right distance, and you'll adjust it for yourself. Um, just don't don't choke up on it and have it right on top of it. Plus, your hand is probably inside of that hat. You may want to be careful about that, too. 
<laughs> you're going to heat yourself up and get a hot finger. But uh, certainly just hold it a few inches away from the foam and move it back and forth. Uh, that's the other thing, too. Don't stay in one position too long. By the time it's too hot, you may not know it before it happens. Um, move it across the design. You'll see it shrink up and adjust accordingly. Um, I found that especially you get cheap heat guns, they, just because it says a temperature or it has an adjustment on it, that doesn't mean that one adjusts the same across the board. So you're going to have to do a little bit of testing. Um, and honestly, once you're dialed in and you know how it works, uh, it'll be worthwhile even if you toasted a couple hats in the process. <laughs> <laughs> well, good term. What um, what are your thoughts on using 3D embroidery on polo shirts or sweatshirts? Um, I've seen it used pretty successfully on sweatshirts. Uh, it just depends on what the customer is into. I don't love it on polo shirts sometimes because it can be heavy. Uh, you've got a lot of stitching there. You've got a lot of density. And if the material is light enough, it can tear. Sweatshirts are different because they just have more body to them. Uh, so you can do it on sweatshirts. I've seen it be pretty successful. I've seen it on dress shirts and everything else. Uh, what I find is, once again, because we've got these long loopy satins, you got to make sure that your customer is aware that if they snag this thing, it will try to unravel on them. Um, and it may be rougher to wear it if you have it in any kind of location where it's going to see a lot of abrasion. If it's on the back of something and the person's going to be jumping in and out of trucks all day, it may not be a great idea for workwear. <laughs> also, this isn't something that's uh, particularly fire safe, as you know, since you can shrink it with heat. Uh, I wouldn't use it for every application or every job. Um, but I have used it successfully, especially on uh, sweatshirts and jackets, and it's it's fine for that. It's not my first choice just because I tend to make a lot of things that I, I expect to wear a long time. And it, it doesn't wear the way that a fill stitch, of course, on a flat uh, regular embroidery is going to wear. So as long as your customer is aware of that and they're and you are careful with that and washing instructions, stuff like that, um, if they throw this thing through mechanical laundry or, you know, industrial laundry, I wouldn't expect that to be a great thing. Um, then I think it's fine. But do be aware that if you're running on, you know, technical polos or light garments, 3D foam is heavy. And even when worn is going to affect the drape of the garment and the hand. So... Imagine just using that much density, even if you weren't putting foam on it, what would that do to a polo shirt? It's a lot of density. So think about that before you put it on something light. Uh, heavier garments are better if you're going to do that. Thank you. No problem. All right, so pricing. I'm just going to talk about this briefly because, honestly, everybody's pricing is going to differ a little bit. But just these are just some kind of watchwords, some things to think about when you're deciding on the pricing for your 3D foam. First thing is that some people think the stitch count is enough to help with the pricing. Uh, as we know, we're going to have almost double the density. Some folks decide that they don't add any other additional costs and just use their regular stitch count pricing to, to account for this. So you may find that you're happy with the pricing just based on a stitch count if you're already using a stitch count method for uh, pricing your embroidery. But I would say it's worth it to consider your additional labor. There is additional runtime, and honestly, when you're working with these kind of densities and on, on garments that may be difficult, there may be extra thread breaks. There may be some other considerations about how long this takes in the course of the entire job, not just the ideal run for the design. So you're going to have a lot of machine time on these things, and you have finishing time, and the finishing time is extreme. We're talking about taking a design. I told you to take a heat gun and lightly brush that heat over the top of this design until it looks better and occasionally have to poke a little piece of foam in. That's time that you need to pay for. That is a piece, that's somebody on the staff who has to do this stuff. So I think it's worthwhile to do a time study, even if you do it for yourself. You do a design for your own shop and run it and say, here's what the stitch counts were like. This is how much time it took to actually finish this job. Here's what it was per hat. And come up with a rubric that's going to let you know, OK, this is about how much time it's going to take per item or, or with a design of this size to do this finishing to clean up the actual design and have it ready to package. The other thing is the cost of the foam. You've got extra materials cost, either just in the foam itself, or if you're using some embroidery-specific adhesives, if you're using other things to get this finished, uh, it's worthwhile to think of the foam cost as well if you're trying to come up with a really cohesive plan for pricing everything that goes into it. So think about your additional labor. Uh, do a little bit of a time study so you can see exactly what it's taking for your finishing staff or whoever's doing your final uh, packaging to get this thing put together. And think about your cost of your foam. And you may just add a, a markup to your cost of foam the way you do with your markup for your garments. Um, uh, usually, people will do something like that and be pretty happy. But the thing to consider about this is value. If you manage to get a setup where you are doing good foam work, solid work, the 3D foam looks good, it's retail styled, everything's smooth, it runs cleanly, you have value that another shop that won't take on this difficult work doesn't have. This value is something you can price on. And I would say, don't just do this stuff. 
when you're looking at stitch count, you're looking at the additional labor, that's great. You should do that because you should know the base that you have to cover just to make this make sense, just to make a good profit. But you have to think that this is an additional value that another shop might not take on. If it's extra difficulty, uh, if it's just being able to do this stuff, knowing about it, the education you've just put yourself through today and all the testing you're gonna have to do to get this right, that's value. With that value that you can apply to your customer, you should be able to charge more. Think about the retail costs of hats like this or of garments that use these specialty uh, designs, that use the specialty applications, and apply that when you're doing your pricing. Price your 3D foam enough to make it make sense for you and to differentiate that value for your shop. Now this is just for fun because I wanted to share this. Uh, on the left-hand side of this piece, you're gonna see something really cool. It's a sublimated foam embroidery. Uh, this is from a great guy, uh, Buzzards Bay Embroidery, Tom Farr did these pieces on the left-hand side, and it, the same piece in white is what's on the left-hand side. He's used an all, of course, a white polyester thread. If you know much about sublimation printing, you know you need to print on polyester materials. What you might not know is that you can take yourself some foam embroidery like this, use your cap heat press, and apply a sublimated all-over print to that thread. It's just something cool, and why do I show this here? It's not something technical I'm gonna teach you about necessarily, but it's so I want you to Think about these things that are outside of the box that provide extra value. For the time and cost of a sublimated pressing, we have an incredible amount of visual interest that we can now sell our customer. This is something that you should think about with any of these specialty applications. The real thing you're selling the customer is not a 3D foam hat. What you're selling them is the ability for their promotional piece to stick out more than that of the others that are around them. You're selling them brand identification. You're selling them marketing value. And you're also getting to do something really cool and fun. So think about the applications you can do with the sublimated foam. Think about the applications you can do with foam in general and all of that extra dimension that you can add. And on the right-hand side, we're gonna go ahead and show that foam heart just one more time. And this is for a little bit of a squishy thing I'm gonna tell you folks. Uh, I just want you guys to take it to heart that you can do something different and that you can expand it to do something that's beyond what you've been doing now. Uh, if you followed along with this, you can do 3D foam embroidery. It sounds very complicated, but in the end, that preparation, that learning, it really pays off and you can do incredibly dimensional treatments that will just stun your customers. And this piece here, I actually took it from what was originally just a uh, setup so that we could demonstrate it for the, uh, foam, the foam advertisement for the initial bodybuilder rollout. And I made this into a stock design on my own site, and I have people who've used it for dresses, I've had people use it for jackets, people have used this stock design on all kinds of things on all sorts of different machines, and got wonderful results. So really, you can do 3D foam, take it to heart, try something new, I think you'll really enjoy it. Eric, thank you so much. Uh, we have run over by about 15 minutes, and I want to thank everybody who has stayed with us. Um, we want to let you know here that um, Eric will be teaching at the upcoming NEP Embroidery and Digitizing Conference on September 13th and 15th in Indianapolis. Um, this is part of NEP's new professional development program. Uh, you can keep up with Eric's latest articles and his events at ericcampbell.com. Madeira USA would like to offer you a 10% um, savings on an order, any order that you place, if you include any bodybuilder foam or our regular foam. Um, also, I wanted to remind everyone, because uh, a few folks did write in that they had to leave to speak with a customer or to um, they got interrupted in other ways. Um, this webinar, while, while we are about to wrap it up, um, will continue in the sense that we've recorded it and we'll be sending you a link to that recorded webinar. A printable version um, is also available and Eric has prepared a companion piece to the printed PowerPoint slides so that um, especially some of the facts, some of the numbers that he's mentioned throughout, you'll have right in front of you. Um, Eric has agreed to answer questions that we were not able to answer. Some of the questions that came through were very, very specific to jobs that people were working on, machines that they used. Um, so we, we skipped a couple, uh, but we will be circling back and sharing with you all of Eric's answers. Um, he does have contact information on his handout. Um, if you download that, you'll be able to see how to reach him. Um, but you'll also be hearing from us um, in, in a follow-up email.
that will give you all the information about Madeira Special and also about contacting Eric. Um, Eric, thank you so much. Um, all of us at Madeira USA want to thank you. Uh, the marketing team here squished into the conference room at Madeira. Uh, we so appreciate uh, your sharing all your knowledge with our customers and um, we just really count you as a special person and thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you very much for having me and thank you to all the people out there who uh, listened and uh, kept through despite my quick talking and all the <laughs> complication that there is in 3D foam. Uh, I really would love you guys to try it and definitely get back to me with all your cool tests and hey the person who want to do the contrasting foam thing let's let's get back together and see <laughs> That's this right. Never heard that before I bet. Yeah, get on um, get onto social media and let's let's share this stuff. Everybody can learn from each other and learn from that testing that we're doing. Expect <laughs> an email from Madeira USA. Um, please open it. It will uh, it will include all the links that I mentioned and you will be able to refer back to Eric's webinar. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I have one more thing to share on the end of that title card. Also, uh, you'll see that uh, there's one little other icon for the only stitch. I have a very, very small stock design collection. It's literally like 20 something designs. It's odd little designs, Viking Age stuff I like and other fun things. Uh, I went ahead and put a, a code out for you guys for the rest of this month. Uh, go to theonlystitch.com and you'll get 50% off your entire order. The reason that's important to you, for you guys is that that little heart that I showed you with that 3D foam that has the tapered points and everything in there, it is there and you can test it. So you can get it for half off for the rest of the month and actually get to test your uh, Madeira Bodybuilder foam with the design that we used for it and showed you today. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much.